Hello, my name is Jaru. Today I'm talking about Deltarune. There will be major spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale, so please play them both before watching this. Today I will be doing something a little bit different. You see, while I've been working on my other, bigger projects, I've been digging around in Deltarune's code using the Undertale mod tool to try and find some secrets. And as it turns out, there's quite a lot of interesting things to discuss in here. So today I'm going to be going over five of the fascinating things I've discovered in Deltarune's code. I should clarify that when I say discoveries, I mean that they were discoveries to me. I'm not suggesting that I'm the first person to discover these things, I'm just saying that I've personally never heard about them. And if I've never heard about them, then there's a decent chance you've never heard about them either. And even if you have heard about these discoveries before, you haven't heard them interpreted through the lens of Jaru. So I think I'll still have some interesting commentary to provide. However, before we can get to all that, we've got to talk about today's sponsor, Raid Shadow... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not sponsored. Did you really think I was? That's adorable. I don't get sponsors. I'm nobody. But I got you for a second, didn't I? <laughs> Uh, but seriously, I don't have any sponsors, but what I do have is fan art! We've got some awesome new fan art since the last video, including this epic piece. We've got the titans in the back, the earth splitting, and most importantly of all, Oberon Smog, the roaring knight in the front. So freaking epic. Thank you so much for this. It's really flipping cool. Uh, next is this animated gif of Chris shortly after stabbing Asriel. <laughs> and you can see the faintest hint of Asriel's body in the bottom left, as well as the surging dark fountain that Chris made as a consequence of all this. Very cool gif. I'm always so blown away when people make actual animations as fan art. That's just too awesome. Thank you very much. Next is another Oberon Smog rendition, and holy cow is this intense. My man looks like he's gonna suck out your soul through his eyeballs. <laughs> The dark pendant on his chest is also quite cool, and the overall blue color palette is really neat. Thank you for this awesome rendition. Next is a two-parter, which starts with this picture of Susie saying, Hey Chris, check this out, I'm a freaking dragon! And then it transitions to this piece, which is just the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Oh my god. Susie's ascending into the heavens. <laughs> into the heaven I go. <laughs> this is just the best thing ever. You can even see Chris in the bottom right and the angel at the top. And I just cannot express how much joy this brings me. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, man. Next is this gorgeous set of pieces depicting the fun gang, starting with Ralse. And oh my god, is this just amazing. You can see how it depicts both Ralse and the character that he represents, as he is the Deltarune version of Flowey. So you can see the thorns and flowers creeping up his legs and sitting in his hair. The, the fireball, of course, being a staple of the dreamers, and naturally some flowers and the word Flowey in the background. And I just adore this. Also, in this art style, with Rousey being super tall and his robe becoming this huge billowing dress, can I just say, this is overwhelmingly cute. Like, this might be my favorite Rousey depiction of all time. It's just so freaking precious. <laughs> Next is Susie, and oh, be still, my beating heart. 
The big poofy pants tucking into the huge boots is awesome. I love her little vest. And best of all, she's a flipping dragon! <laughs> I cannot express how much I adore this depiction of Susie. Jesus Christ. The horns, the wings, the tail. God, she's so precious. This art style messes me up, man. And lastly is our precious innocent protagonist, Cress, who looks just overwhelmingly cute. They've got their awesome ascot billowing. They're seeing their eyes just makes them look so friendly. And I absolutely adore the giant scrunched up striped socks that they're wearing. That is such a fun creative choice. Chris is also wielding the twisted sword, which looks absolutely fabulous. And last but certainly not least, you can see the special word in the background is Asriel with an upside down and broken heart as the dot on the eye, as well as some various hearts in the background, all of which is hinting at the true nature of Chris as well, which is just so awesome. Here's all three of the characters together, and can I just say, your art is inspiring. It fills my heart with joy every time I see any of your work. I never pronounce the names of the artists because I know I'll end up butchering them, but it's on screen, you know who you are, and you are overwhelmingly talented. Thank you for blessing all of us with your work. Next is this epic Oberon smog design, and can I just say, this is a fantastically designed suit of armor for the Roaring Knight. If you've watched my playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 1, you'll know that I actually suspect that the downward pointing arrow is in fact a symbol of the Roaring Knight. So the fact that you've managed to integrate it here alongside the Deltarune and with the angel's wings acting as horns on the helmet is just the sickest thing. Fantastic design. And of course, I love seeing the face of Oberon Smog on the side here. The scar and the goatee are especially cool. Thank you so much for this fantastic Oberon Smog design. It is phenomenal. Next is this piece depicting a whole pile of characters. This is a super unique art style, and it's really impressive how much range you demonstrate in this one piece. Like, Noelle looks super cute, Spamton looks terrifying, I love Ralsei's hairstyle, Susie looks both cool and scary, and best of all is Chris, who not only has the fantastic Giga Chad jawline, but is also rocking bronze armor for a change, which is a really unique look for them. Fantastic piece. Love the creative liberties. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. Next is another gif, this time of Susie sweating due to her suddenly sprouting massive epic dragon wings. I love how well these wings match Susie's color palette while also looking pretty unique as far as wings go. Thank you very much. Like I said, always blown away by animation. And last but certainly not least is this. Someone went whole hog and just turned Susie into a full-blown dragon, and I love it. Look how freaking epic this is. She looks like something out of Bloodborne, which is absolutely a compliment. It utterly blows my mind how faithful you managed to stay to Susie's design while also turning her into this epic beast. The hair and mouth work so well here despite literally just being what her face and mouth usually look like. And having the spikes on her back match the spikes on her armbands is just perfect. And don't even get me started on the shockingly well detailed muscles which just just looks so freaking cool. Thank you so much for this. It is truly amazing. And with that, we've caught up with the fan art. 
Thank all of you so much. Again, receiving fan art from you incredibly talented people is easily my favorite part of doing YouTube. It actually just makes me so freaking happy in a way that very few things can. Thank you for your support. God bless all of you. And with all that discussed, we can now move on to the video. Here are five discoveries I've found in Deltarune's code. Number one, Revival. Everyone knows how the chapters end, right? Chris and Susie walk up to the fountain, Chris ejects their soul and seals it. However, there may be more going on here than it seems. Within the code, the game actually refers to this event as Revival. Or, to be more precise, it refers to this sound clip as Revival. This could have a lot of lore ramifications depending on what Revival means in this context. Revival can mean an improvement in the condition or strength of something, an instance of something becoming popular, active, or important again, a new production of an old play or similar work, a reawakening of religious fervor, especially by means of a series of evangelical meetings, or a restoration to bodily or mental vigor, to life or consciousness, or to sporting success. Let's discuss these definitions real quick and see how they would make sense in the context of sealing the fountains. An improvement in the condition or strength of something could be in reference to how dark fountains inherently destabilize the world, and thus by sealing them, Chris is improving the fabric of reality itself. They are supposedly preventing the earth from cracking and the sky from running black, right? So that definition adds up. The next definition is an instance of something becoming popular, active, or important again. This is interesting, because in theory, sealing the Dark Fountain is doing the exact opposite of that. The Dark World is becoming inactive and unimportant now that it's sealed. As such, the best way I could spin this definition is that it's talking about Chris. By sealing the fountain, they are going from being some unimportant town weirdo to being the literal savior of the earth. That's quite a substantial rise in importance, I would say. Although, the fact that this definition is about something becoming important again, that would suggest that Chris was important at some point in the past. Could this be referring to Undertale? Or does Chris have some sort of incredible secret past that we don't know about? Hard to say. The next definition is a production of an old play or similar work. And that is incredibly appropriate considering that is a perfect description of Deltarune. Deltarune itself is quite literally a shuffled and reimagined version of the Undertale reality, so that term certainly applies. Although, why would this specific moment be called Revival if it's talking about the entire game being a new production? Maybe instead, it's talking about how this isn't the first time these fountains have been created and then sealed again. If so, when did it happen before? And to who? Did some other human go on an adventure in the Dark World to stop the roaring before Chris? Or is this hinting towards my time loop theory? If this world is trapped in a time loop, then every time Chris seals a fountain, it would be them reenacting something they've already done countless times before, which would suit this definition perfectly. Next is the really spooky definition, the reawakening of religious fervor, especially by means of a series of evangelistic meetings. 
Since the angel is heavily tied up in the plot of the game, the Deltarune, the angel symbol, is plastered all over the light and dark worlds, and the angel's heaven is specifically something brought about via the creation of a series of dark fountains, aka a series of evangelistic meetings, I'd say a reawakening of religious fervor is a pretty solid interpretation of this story. That said, the term revival being applied to the noise that a fountain makes when it's getting sealed may contradict this interpretation, as Chris is actively working against the angel in this scene. As such, if not the angel, then what kind of religious fervor is being reawakened by Chris sealing the fountain? Is this event reawakening religious fervor in Chris and Susie? Is it reawakening religious fervor in the Darkners as they worship the Lightners as gods? Or does this have to do with the entity inside Chris's soul? Are they somehow tied to this religious fervor? The answer is unclear. The last definition is a restoration to bodily or mental vigor, to life or consciousness, or to sporting success. Now this could simply be saying that Chris and the world are being restored to sporting success as a result of them sealing the fountains. However, a much cooler and scarier alternative is that someone or something is slowly being brought back to life as a result of Chris sealing these dark fountains. Is the entity in Chris's soul growing in power and becoming more conscious as Chris does this? Is Chris themselves the one being revived? Or is this talking about the angel being revived? Given what Ralsei said, it would seem like sealing the fountains is doing the opposite of reviving the angel. But then again, maybe Ralsei was wrong about all this, or maybe Ralsei is lying, and in reality, the dark fountains are the only thing that can stop the angel, and thus Chris sealing the fountain is only contributing to the angel being revived instead. Or, if you believe in my Ralsei theory, maybe a certain person beloved by Chris is being slowly revived by all this, and that's why Chris made their own dark fountain. Maybe they want to revive you-know-who as fast as possible, so they're creating more dark fountains with the specific intention of sealing those dark fountains in order to revive their loved one. No matter which of these definitions is the one being used here, I think we can all agree that this term in this context is extremely fascinating. And that's only the first discovery of this video. Number two, wake up. At the very start of chapter one, there's this intro in which we build a vessel and it's discarded. This scene ends with this text on screen as it transitions into Chris waking up in their bedroom. However, I have found that there is additional text within the files that would normally appear in this scene, but due to how it's programmed, it never does. The text says, Chris, wake up, Chris. This YouTube channel has actually re-implemented that text to see how it would work, and it has this cool echoing effect on the words as they appear. It also has a voice, which is very interesting. The voice clip it uses is labeled text echo in the files, and while it's not confirmed, the consensus in the community is that this echoing voice is actually a slowed down version of Susie's voice. That is incredibly fascinating. Chris did not know Susie at the start of chapter one, or at least they didn't have any sort of relationship with her. So how could Chris be dreaming about this scene? Well, there's a couple possibilities. One, 
At some point in the past, Chris fell asleep in class and Susie had to wake them up. Two, Chris has dreams of the future somehow. Three, this intro sequence is not a dream, and in reality, this sequence happens much later on in the story. Four, Chris is having deja vu of a previous timeline because they are actually stuck in a time loop. Let's briefly discuss these options real quick. The first option with Chris falling asleep in class is pretty basic, boring, and believable. I don't have much to say on that. The second option, Chris having dreams of the future, doesn't really make sense. However, it could be that Chris has a shadow crystal and that has allowed them to see visions of the future which they are now dreaming about. Of course, that's working off the assumption that shadow crystals show visions of the future, which we don't actually know is true. The third option, that this intro scene takes place in the future, is a very valid possibility. We have no concrete proof that this sequence with Gaster and the vessel happens immediately before Chris wakes up. We are shown one event after the other, but that doesn't prove that they happened consecutively. After all, in Undertale, Frisk could randomly have dreams that had to do with Kara, even though Frisk is not Kara and those events happened years ago. So we know Toby Fox is happy to show strange and mysterious visions long after or before they actually occur. And lastly, my favorite option, Chris is having a dream of a previous timeline due to them having deja vu. This is tied to an ongoing theory on my channel that Deltarune is stuck in a time loop in which the characters get their memories erased and the timeline is reset over and over and over again. We know from Undertale that characters can have deja vu of past timelines, so it's entirely possible that this is what Chris is experiencing in this scene where Susie is begging them to wake up. Overall, there's lots of fascinating possibilities with this discovery, and I'd love to hear what you guys think of this mysterious text. Number 3. Shelter one of the more mysterious elements of the hometown is this strange set of metal doors leading underground. What is the purpose of this structure? What role did it play in the past? What role will it play in the future? Well, Deltarune's code may provide a hint, as this room is referred to as a shelter. A shelter is a place that gives temporary protection from bad weather or danger, although what kind of danger a shelter protects you from can vary. There are storm shelters, bomb shelters, homeless shelters, animal shelters, and so on. Given that this is an underground shelter of some type, that would imply that it is designed to protect its inhabitants from something happening on the surface. This could make it some sort of storm shelter, some sort of bomb shelter, or some other variety of surface world disaster shelter. The big question that occurs to me, however, is who built this shelter? Was it built by the monsters, or did humans build it at some point before the monsters settled here? The dialogue from Monster Kid and Snowy suggests that Chris has some connection to this place, so maybe that's implying that humans built it. Although, now that I'm on the topic, let's take a closer look at what exactly Snowy and Monster Kid say in this exchange, as I think I might have some insight into this scene that you might not have heard before. Monster Kid starts by saying, You think it's true? You really think there's... And Snowy, after some mockery, replies with, I ain't afraid. Only kids believe that stuff. So, right out the gate, we can tell they're talking about some sort of urban legend. There's a rumor around hometown that there's something inside this shelter. Something scary. 
And that rumor has Monster Kid feeling creeped out, causing them to ask Snowy if they believe the legend is true. Snowy does not believe it, and thinks it's just a made-up story that only kids believe in. Monster Kid tries to argue with Snowy by saying, But Chris which implies that Chris has some past with this shelter that lends credence to the urban legend. Snowy disregards this argument by saying, you gonna be a weenie like Chris? This exchange, from what I can tell, would seem to be implying this. There is an urban legend about something scary in this shelter. Snowy doesn't believe it, but Monster Kid does, and Monster Kid implies that Chris had some sort of run-in with whatever they think is inside this shelter, and that encounter scared Chris. Chris then told other people about this encounter. Monster Kid, upon hearing about this, believed Chris, and is now even more creeped out by this shelter, while Snowy did not believe Chris and thinks they were just being a scaredy cat and that they didn't actually encounter anything. Notably, while Snowy and Monster Kid are disagreeing about whether Chris encountered this urban legend, they are not arguing about whether Chris was inside this shelter. They seem to both agree that Chris did visit this place at some point. That specific detail is not up for debate. They just disagree on whether Chris encountered anything or not. As such, given this reading of this dialogue, it would seem that Chris being brought up in this conversation has nothing to do with the origin of this shelter, and they are simply bringing Chris up because at some point, Chris had an experience involving this place. Now, why Chris had an encounter with this place and what it means for their story is a whole other can of worms and is a question for another video. For now, with regards to establishing the origin of this shelter, there seems to be no clear answer. The past of this place remains a mystery. However, one detail that I think is interesting is that if this shelter was built by the monsters to be used in an emergency, then it is entirely possible that if the roaring ever comes to pass, then there's a decent chance that the citizens living in the hometown will gather inside of this shelter. If that were to happen, I could totally see us having a chance in a future chapter to explore a completely abandoned version of the hometown, which means we could theoretically get the opportunity to uncover some major secrets by exploring houses and buildings that we couldn't access before. That may not happen, of course, but if it did, that would be pretty awesome. Number four. Lancer can dodge? Dodging attacks has always been a fascinating mechanic in both Undertale and Deltarune, as it is often used to signify that an opponent is incredibly powerful. Sans famously dodges all your attacks, which is why he's so hard to beat. Hyper God of Death Azrael dodges all of your attacks as well, due to him being a god. There's even a popular fan theory that Asgore is capable of dodging attacks as well, as he did so during his fight with Undyne in her backstory, and the only reason, theoretically, we're able to hit him when we fight him as Frisk is because he hates himself so much for what he's done that he thinks he deserves to die. Point is, being able to dodge attacks has always been associated with great power. So imagine my surprise when I stumble across this little line of code in Deltarune's files. All Chapter 1 enemies seem to have this variable stating whether they can dodge, called can dodge, and most of them are set to 
false. The only exception seems to be Lancer in his first boss fight and in his final fight against Susie. Now, this is where my inexperience with coding comes back to bite us, because it's entirely possible that I'm misunderstanding what this code means. Maybe it's just referring to the fact that there's moments in both fights where attacks can miss Lancer. So take this discovery with a grain of salt. However, if it's true that Lancer can dodge, then that would be very interesting, as it would further support the fact that Lancer is bizarrely powerful. For those who don't know, Lancer's HP stat increases massively over the course of Chapter 1. He starts with 500 HP in this first fight, and he ends the chapter with 2400 HP in the final fight against Susie. For context on how insane that is, here are the few characters with more HP than Lancer. Yeah, you may notice that it is exclusively bosses and super bosses. They're not even that much more than Lancer. When the king said Lancer would have survived the fall from the top of his castle, he probably wasn't kidding. Although, I should point out that during his fight with Susie, Lancer's defense stat drops to negative 40, while his attack drops from 5 to 4. That doesn't necessarily mean Lancer isn't powerful, he most certainly is, but this does show that the stats of Darkners are incredibly variable, potentially implying that they, much like the monsters from Undertale, have stats that vary with their state of mind. Lancer didn't want to fight Susie, so his attack and defense fell, but he was also completely unwilling to let her kill his dad, so his HP skyrocketed to reflect his unwillingness to get out of the way. What this could mean for the greater lore is a topic for another time, but for now, let's just say that Lancer is a tough boy, and him enhancing that toughness with the ability to dodge would certainly be an interesting development. Number 5. One Intro Speaker This is the final and probably biggest discovery that I will be discussing in this video, as it is about the mysterious entity who speaks to us at the beginning of Chapter 1. If you've been listening to the theories in the Deltarune community, you'll probably know that it's widely believed that this entity who helps us build the vessel is, in fact, Gaster. And if you've been listening to the theories in the community more recently, you'll probably know that at this part of the intro, when the text says that our vessel will be discarded, it is widely believed that this is a completely different character speaking from the one who had been speaking previously. Specifically, a lot of folks believe this is Kara. Why do people believe this? Well, the reason is due to something within Deltarune's code known as a typer. A typer is a string of code that tells the game how to present text. This includes what kind of font the text will have, as well as what kind of voice clip will be used. For example, typer number 14 is used by Sans, and thus, when that typer is used, it will put the text into Comic Sans font, and will play the iconic Sans voice clip. As a result, by paying attention to what typers are used, we can usually tell who is talking in any given scene. This is especially pertinent in the intro sequence, as the person who first starts talking to us with this text is using typer number 666, which is a number associated with Gaster. Once the intro moves to this part of the vessel creation process, the typer changes to typer number 667. 
Despite this being a different typer than 666, it's still safe to assume that this is Gaster still talking, as not only are there no other typers anywhere close to as high of a number as 666, but also when a character has multiple different typers assigned to them, those typers usually have numbers very close to one another. For example, Spamton uses typer numbers 66, 67, and 68. And yes, Spamton also having the number 6 prominently featured in his typer number is probably not a coincidence. However, while typer number 666 and 667 are used for the vast majority of this intro sequence, there's one segment where this changes, specifically when this text starts to play. It has no voice, it uses the default Deltarune font, and it has a brand new typer that is nowhere close to where Gaster's typer was. This text uses typer number 2. Since this typer is so different from Gaster's, a lot of the community concluded that this was a different character speaking. And due to how this text gets translated in Japanese and how similar the Japanese version is to the way Kara speaks at the end of Undertale, that led the community to theorize that this second entity speaking in the intro is in fact Kara. However, that is where my discovery comes in. You see, I discovered two very important things about this typer. The first thing, which is pretty important in its own right, is the fact that typer number two is coded to only be used in the light world. Certain characters, specifically ones who travel between the dark and light worlds like Susie, Noelle, and Birdly, have specific parts of their code that force them to use certain typers in the light world and certain other typers in the dark world. For example, Susie has to use typer number 10 if she's in the light world, but she has to use typer number 30 if she's in the dark world. Similarly, typer number two, the exact typer used by this mysterious entity, is also coded to only be used in the light world, which would seem to confirm that whenever this cutscene is taking place, it is taking place in the light world and not the dark world. There's a lot of lore ramifications for this, especially since this is all tied up with Gaster. But God knows Gaster deserves his own video, so I'll instead focus on the second discovery I made regarding Typer number 2. You see, after searching through the code, I've discovered that there is precisely one other time that Typer number 2 is used in Deltarune. It is used first in the intro, when the entity says our vessel will now be discarded, and then after that, it is then used one more time by one specific character in one specific scene. Can you guess who it is? I bet you can't. It's used in chapter one. It's used by one of the main characters. It is used by... Susie. That's right, everyone's favorite purple dragon shares a typer with the entity in the intro, and she is the only other character to use this typer. Is this some crazy plot twist? Is this revealing that Susie is tied to Gaster and she's the secret mastermind behind the entire game? Well, no, it doesn't. And I can prove it. You see, some of the typer values include a variable known as underscore speaker. This variable doesn't appear on all the typers, but it does appear on the typers used by the main characters, and it informs us who is speaking when this typer is being used. Like I said earlier, typers number 10 and 30 are both used by Susie, and as such, they are both labeled as Susie in the underscore speaker part of the code. And, very importantly, typer number 2 
also has the underscore speaker variable. And in that variable, it does not say Susie. Instead, it simply says silent. Why is it labeled silent? Simple. When this typer is used during the intro, all sound cuts out. No music is playing, no voice clip is being used, and the text appears on screen completely silently. Similarly, when Susie uses this typer, it's only for this one line, which, as you may recall, appears on screen completely silently. If that wasn't enough, there's one other typer that has the speaker labeled as silent. The typer in question is typer number 36, which is exclusively used in the dark world. This typer is also only used by one character, and in an amusing twist, it's the king. Specifically, this typer is only used during his intro scene where the king is cloaked in shadow, and during this time, his text appears on screen without any sort of sound accompanying it, aka it appears silently. As such, we can safely conclude that typer number two does not exclusively represent Susie, and typer number 36 does not exclusively represent King. These are just generic typers used whenever the situation calls for it. That also explains why typer number two is such a low number. Typers number 1 through 6 are all generic typers used in various scenes by various characters. However, because typer number 2 is a generic typer that can be used by any character, that reveals something important about this intro scene. It starts off with Typer 666. It transitions to Typer 667 once the trippy background appears and it says, first you must create a vessel. And then, at the very end, it transitions to Typer 2 when it says, will now be discarded. It's safe to say that the first two typers are gaster related in some way. However, now that we know Typer 2 is a generic typer, that means we have no proof that this dialogue at the end of the intro is being used by a different character. If Susie can switch from using her usual Typer number 10 to use Typer number 2 for one sentence, then it's entirely feasible that Gaster could switch to Typer number 2 as well. Remember that this silent text is used to make the character seem more intimidating. The intro character is using it to appear cold and cruel. Susie is using it to try and scare Chris, while King is using the Dark World version in order to appear mysterious and threatening. As such, it's entirely believable that all three of these typers used in the intro are being used by the same character. It's also possible that all three are different characters. That's the issue with typers. They're not concrete evidence. But the reason I bothered to explain all this was because, up until now, it had been considered an accepted fact that this final text in the intro was a different speaker due to them using a different typer. However, as I've just explained, this final speaker using typer number two doesn't actually prove anything. Even the strange grammar used in the Japanese version could easily be explained away as Gaster switching to a stranger, harsher dialect in order to hammer home how cruel he is, or something along those lines. I'm all for the community digging into the game's code to find secrets, but it's important that we not leap to conclusions with faulty logic. It could absolutely still be Kara talking at the end of this intro sequence, but if so, you'll have to find evidence for that interpretation somewhere other than the typers, as the typers don't actually support this interpretation any more than they support any other interpretation.
And with that, we've reached the end of the five discoveries I have to discuss. You may have noticed that this video was not about Spamton, despite that being the topic that was chosen overwhelmingly in the poll I ran, but there's a reason for that. The last few months, I've been pumping out huge video after huge video because the night video did so well, and I wanted to keep up that momentum. However, as many of you suspected, trying to upload huge projects like that back to back every single month was not sustainable, and was actually proving to be bad for my health. As such, I decided to change my YouTube strategy. I still want to make larger projects, but not back to back. Instead, I'm going to try to upload a larger number of videos, but shorter in length and easier to produce, like today's 5 Discoveries video. That way, I won't have to stress out about rushing to get my next big project done in time. Instead, I can work on videos like the Spamton analysis in the background while I upload smaller videos, and then I'll surprise y'all with a 5 hour Spamton video somewhere down the line. I think this upload schedule, with several small videos between the larger projects, will be much more sustainable and much easier on me. I hope you guys are okay with this new methodology. Please let me know what you think of today's video, what you think of my new upload strategy, and of course, what kinds of small and large projects you'd like to see me tackle. And if you'd like to hear more of my insane ramblings, then you might want to follow me on Twitter. I occasionally talk about Deltarune and occasionally spend several weeks in a row reviewing every Pokemon trainer's design for no good reason. Uh, fair warning, I am incredibly stupid and say lots of stupid things on social media. And with that, <laughs> I think I'll sign off for today. Like if you enjoyed the video, comment if you got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.